I am going to explain morality. <laughs> this is a pretty tall order, but I'm going to try to do it. All right, so this is uh, an essay called What is Morality? I'm going to read it. I might expand on a few points uh, as I go through it, but I'll try to stick pretty closely to the text to avoid rambling. Okay, so here we go. What is morality? Morality has the following components. Collective values. The individual internalization of collective values. The assumption that collective values are objective and thus moral. A folk theory of morality and individual and collective moral myths. Okay, so this is kind of like a layer cake, and the plate that the cake is on is individual values. And so I'm going to go through these layers that constitute morality, starting with collective values and how they arise out of individual values. As individuals, we naturally make value judgments about what is good or bad for ourselves. For example, a man might want to marry a beautiful woman. He views that outcome as good for himself. In other words, he values it positively. Individual values define what the individual views as good for himself or bad for himself. And I'm not going to get into explaining what individual values are, how they arise, etc., but I'm going to take for granted the existence of these individual values, that individuals make value judgments, they want something, they don't want something else, etc., Okay, so like I said, that's the plate, and the cake sits on that plate. Individual values are perspective-dependent. They are tied to the perspective of an individual. Different people make different value judgments. Individual values are often in conflict because people compete for resources and mates. For example, if two men want to marry the same woman, their individual values are in conflict. Each wants a different outcome. Each positively values the outcome in which he marries the woman and negatively values the outcome in which the other man marries the woman. They make opposing value judgments about those outcomes. And so values can relate to each other in various ways. They could be conflicting, they could be convergent, they could be independent, but they're not necessarily independent. They very often have some kind of relationship. And because we're living beings, because we compete naturally for resources and mates, uh, individual values are often in conflict. Although individual values may be in conflict, Individuals can find ways to cooperate for their mutual benefit. For example, people who depend on a stream for drinking water could agree to protect its water quality because they have a common preference for clean water. By itself, that common preference is not enough to create cooperation. They have to solve a problem of cooperation that is called the tragedy of the commons. So just because people might agree that, hey, the world would be a better place if we had clean water, that doesn't stop them from polluting it. Uh, you have to have incentives to align individual interests with collective interests or individual values with collective values. And I talked about that in an essay called Game Theory and Cooperation. Uh, there's a version of it on my blog. I think it's called Game Theory and Society or something like that. But the better, more up-to-date version is in the book On the Edge. So if you, ha if you don't have that, it's like five bucks on Amazon. And, you know, I don't really need the money. 
I should have probably just made it a buck or something. I don't really care, but you know, a buck, five bucks, whatever. It's not very expensive. Although I will probably put up a, a new blog uh, somewhere else that has updated versions of everything eventually. But you know, the book is still kind of handy, I guess, if you're if you're interested in these topics. Yeah. So <laughs> that's my little plug for myself. Okay. Um, but yeah, I'm just saying that seriously because that is the best version of it. Anyway, uh, so where was I? People can also find ways of competing that are less destructive. For example, two men who want the same woman could agree to let her choose between them rather than fighting over her. So even that is a form of cooperation, right? Okay, collective values emerge out of this interplay between individual values where individual values may be in alignment like but two people want this something similar like they want uh, the drinking water to be clean or they might be in conflict but maybe they can find a way to reduce conflict or you know make it less harmful all right and out of this interplay of individual values collective values emerge they define what is good or bad for a collective for example, polluting the water supply is bad is a collective value judgment. It prohibits an individual behavior that is harmful to the collective. Collective values are tied to the perspective of a collective rather than the perspective of an individual. But they're not from the perspective of the universe. They're not God's values. They're not cosmic values. They're not logical values. They're collective values. And as I said, they emerge from the interplay of individual values in a social context. They represent solutions to problems of cooperation. For example, do not murder solves a prisoner's dilemma. Right. Every time you pass a stranger on the street, there's a kind of prisoner's dilemma in that situation. Like he could kill you, you could kill him. Right. And in the absence of a society to impose the law, do not murder. Uh, that becomes a very real problem. Right. People, strangers will kill each other. You know, like m members of one uh, Amazon tribe that happened to run into the uh, members of another Amazon tribe somewhere might, you know, just start fighting. They might start killing each other because uh, they don't have an overarching um, system that prevents that. And the same thing is true of other collective values, like do not pollute the water supply is a solution to a tragedy of the commons. Now, it's important to understand that collective values do not by themselves solve problems of cooperation. They merely point at solutions to them. They make the solution normative, collectively normative, but they don't by themselves generate the solution. Incentives are necessary to impose collectively good behavior on individuals. Collective values merely define good and bad from a collective perspective. But that is a very important function. Collective values are necessary for society, but they are not sufficient for society. That's important to understand. Society needs mechanisms to impose collective values on individuals. Collective values arise out of individual selfishness not altruism. Cooperation is selfish. It benefits both sides. Society benefits its members. And so they have an incentive to create and maintain it. Most people are willing to give up the freedom to kill others for protection from being killed by others. Right? This is the downfall of anarcho-capitalism or any form of anarchism, that the social contract is how you solve problems of cooperation. People are willing to, to sacrifice the convenience of polluting the water supply in return for the benefit of clean water. 
collective values arise out of individual values, but they do not directly reflect them because they resolve conflicts between them. Again, see game theory and cooperation in On the Edge, right? So it's not just like the sum of individual values will produce collective values. Uh, you know, the, the sum of de, uh, defect, defect, and the prisoner's dilemma is not cooperate, cooperate, right? That's a different value that can emerge um, if those two players are interacting on a regular basis. They can, you know, sort of agree to cooperate. Collect it. And, and by the way, I should say, if you want to understand society, you have to understand game theory. If you don't understand game theory, you won't understand society. I mean, literally, you'll have no clue what's going on. You'll have a bunch of myths, you'll have a bunch of delusions or like just false beliefs, but you won't understand society at all until you understand problems of cooperation. And game theory um, is an abstraction that clarifies what those are. Okay, anyway, uh, back to reading. Uh, let's see, where was I? Collective values emerge naturally out of social interaction and communication. In that way, they are analogous to language. People didn't sit down one day and make up the English language. It emerged. A tacit agreement on how to use words emerged out of our attempts to communicate. Collective values also emerge by tacit agreement. We discover values that work for us as a collective, and those values become generally accepted. Collective values are created by agreement, and they exist in the same way that language exists, as part of culture. Okay, so just like language is, is a cultural form, that we create, collective values are a cultural form that we create. There was no, there's no God that wrote down the Ten Commandments. Those rules of social interaction emerged culturally. Okay, and then maybe people pretended that they had been given those by God because they couldn't understand another way that those could have come about. And they maybe they wanted to personify the authority that lies behind those. The authority of the collective becomes personified as the authority of God. But they don't come from God. They come from us. All right. The next layer is internalization. Children acquire moral knowledge subconsciously from their social and family environments. They learn what they are supposed to do allowed to do, and not supposed to do. The child learns that some acts are bad and others are good, and that bad acts are punished, while good acts are rewarded. So the child learns that the so in the social environment, some things are labeled bad, other things are labeled good, and those acts are associated with rewards and punishments. Moral knowledge is not instinctive. Uh, there, there are social instincts, but that's not morality. Moral knowledge is acquired knowledge of collective values. So morality is no more instinctive than language is instinctive. You have the innate ability to learn a language, but English is not encoded in your DNA, nor is French, in a French person's DNA, or, you know, a Chinese in a Chinese speaker's DNA, or whatever. You learn language, and you learn morality. Of course, moral knowledge depends on instincts. Without instinctive desires, there would be no value judgments at all. There would be no individual values. There would be no plate for the cake. Moral judgments are associated with certain emotions, such as guilt, shame, and pride. But morality does not arise directly from emotions. The individual has to learn the morality of his social environment. Also, the apparently moral emotions have selfish functions, 
Guilt is fear of punishment. Shame is fear of rejection. Pride is the expectation of reward or approval. These feelings reflect tacit knowledge of social incentives. Morality is somewhat arbitrary because it depends on the environment and because it is learned from experience. Different societies have different moralities, although they tend to overlap considerably because the same problems of cooperation exist in most times and places. Different people will acquire different moral knowledge from the same environment because of differences in personality and how others treat them. Like men will probably develop a slightly different set of moral intuitions than women, because men have a different place in society and people treat them differently, and so they will develop a different set of moral intuitions. Like a woman might have a very strong moral intuition that she is worthy of protection and support from society, and a man might not have that same moral intuition. Moral judgments are mostly intuitive. Now, this doesn't mean instinctive, it means intuitive, which is to say they are pre-conscious, they're not generated by a conscious process. They're generated by subconscious pattern recognition, essentially. Consciously, moral judgments are experienced in much the same way as perceptions. People are aware of their moral judgments just as, you know, a direct awareness, like that's good or that's bad. Just like I'm aware of the tree outside the window by an immediate perception of it, I don't have to think, what is that thing? Maybe it's an elephant, maybe it's, uh, you know, uh, the, the Andromeda galaxy, maybe it's a tree, I don't know, I have to think about it. No, it's just an immediate, like, awareness of it as a tree, and moral judgments are mostly experienced in the same way. They're just intuitive and immediate and the person has no conscious awareness of the underlying basis of the judgment, right? Just like I have no conscious awareness of how I'm judging that to be a tree. Um, when people make moral judgments, they have no conscious awareness of what the underlying conceptual knowledge is that, that's used to generate that judgment. And that's why people can't explain why they view certain things as good and other things as bad because they don't have access to the basis of the judgments. They just assume that they're recognizing real goodness and real badness in the same way that they perceive real objects and events. Very few people question that assumption or wonder what moral goodness and badness really are. Now the objectivity assumption. The objectivity assumption is the belief that collective values, or in other words, moral values, and this is where they become moral values. That's when you assume that they are objective. That kind of makes them into moral values because that confusion is like a necessary part of morality. Without it, they're not moral. They're just collective. Anyway, just like, you know, the, the rules of chess, people don't see those as moral. They see those as something we made up. But then there are these other values that they don't see as something that people made up. Okay, so, uh, yeah, the objectivity assumption is the belief that collective values are objectively real and moral knowledge is knowledge of this objective reality. In this view, good and bad are objective properties of agents, intentions, and actions. Moral knowledge is the presumably innate, although well, I don't think people usually think very much about where does it come from, but they assume that they have this innate ability to recognize objective good and bad. And there is some truth to this view. It's not entirely true, but there isn't, you know, there is some truth to it which is that morality is objective in the sense that collective values have an objective existence 
and they are not tied to the perspective of a single individual. However, they are tied to the perspective of a collective. Like they have to be in enough minds, just like language. Language is not tied to any one person, right? If one person dies, the English language doesn't disappear. As long as there are English speakers, the English language continues to exist. But that's the nature of its existence. It's independent of any one individual, but it's not independent of human beings. Morality is not perspective independent, nor does it reflect some higher source of values, such as God, the cosmos, or logic. Collective values emerge out of individual values. That's where they get their valueness from. Value is not an objective property of agents, intentions, and actions. Value is projected onto agents, intentions, and actions by individuals and collectives. Moral value judgments do not reflect objective values. They reflect collective values. In the ordinary view of morality, moral values are perspective independent. There is some universal perspective, a God's eye view, from which things are good or bad. And even atheists believe in this God's eye view, or at least most of them do. And yet, the individual also somehow contains this universal perspective within himself as the conscience. So these value judgments, they're not tied to any one's perspective, but it's presumed that you can make them from your perspective, that they exist to you as an alternative type of value judgment. And this is a bit weird. Right, that you have two different types of value judgments in your head, and so you have access to this, you know, uh, external perspective from which one thing is good and another thing is bad. You have access internally to a source of correct moral judgments, and not only that, you're compelled to be good, but you also recognize a distinction between moral values and your own personal values, or between your own interests and moral values, right? If you didn't, there could be no, there could be no inner, you know, struggle between good and evil or whatever, right? Because if you just viewed these as your values, then there would be no struggle, there would be no conscience, there would be no angel on one shoulder and the devil on the other. None of that stuff could exist. And people with you know, who who don't share those moral values or who are, like, evil, well, you would just say, well, they have a different, um, a different set of value judgments in their head or something like that. Um, and, and so this is kind of a contradiction. There's kind of a contradiction built into this view. It's probably hard for most people to see because the view is so entrenched. But there is a kind of contradiction here. If morality is internal to us, then it is subjective and perspective dependent, right? So then it's just what you want. If morality is external to us, if the judgments are emanating from some other perspective, then we are free to reject morality. It, then, then it's not compelling to us. And it must be imposed on us by external forces. Although the ordinary view of morality is incoherent, it does partially reflect the actual nature of the relationship between the individual and collective values. Collective values are not objective, but they are above the individual level, and the individual has internalized this higher perspective, right? So you internalize these values as a child, and that's what the conscience is, that's what moral knowledge is, moral intuitions. And when you make decisions, you often have to resolve conflicts between individual values and collective values, right? You might say, well, I'd really like to do this, but I know it's bad, 
And what that really is saying is, well, I know that I might get in trouble. So there really isn't a conflict there because it really is all about your, your self-interest ultimately. But um, you've internalized part, part of that, like part of the environment. And you sort of pretend that rather than having these um, incentives imposed on you, that you, they're internal to you, they're intrinsic to you. You really want to be good, not because of the incentives. And that's a, a delusion or a lie. So, so I guess there's two, there's really two errors in the, you know, combined here. Like one is this idea that it is objective. The morality is outside of us. It's in the universe. It's in, you know, it's not created by humans. But the other is that it's like subjective, that, it, that you are a good person intrinsically, right? You just are a good person and it's built into you rather than you are a person within a social context who has been raised in a social context who has these values imposed on him by the social context. So those are both errors. And this objectivity assumption is the beginning of all the bullshit. This is the beginning of the, the lies. The objectivity assumption is clearly false. Objective value is an oxymoron. Value judgments cannot be perspective independent. Value does not exist in objectivity. If you think it does, where does it exist? Does it exist in the atoms and the molecules and the quantum wave functions? Where? Where does it exist? I don't think you're going to be able to find it if you take those things apart, but you can find it in culture. Uh, the same thing is true of rights and obligations. This is another thing that people often think is objective, but is actually uh, intersubjective. It is collective. We create rights and obligations. Just like we create the rules of chess or we create the English language, we create uh, the rules of society. We create rights and obligations. And they only exist within a social context and they are relative to that social context. There are no rights and obligations in nature, right? A cheetah has, has no rights. The gazelle that the cheetah is chasing has no rights or obligations. They're just different living beings pursuing their own interests as they perceive them, you know, generated by their brains. They're different value judgments. The cheetah wants to eat the gazelle. The gazelle wants to run from the cheetah. There's no rights or obligations involved. That's something we create. That's part of society. And the objectivity assumption is a confusion between what is social and collective with what is um, objective. All right, now let's talk about the folk theory. Morality includes a simple folk theory of how people make moral judgments. People are assumed to have some internal ability to recognize moral good and bad. This ability is called the conscience, right? This is like a myth. This is um, a kind of folk psychology uh, of uh, morality. Most folk theories don't explain what the conscience is, but some try to. Humanism tries to explain the conscience as due to empathy and compassion. I'm not sure how Christians try to explain it, like... Is it the Holy Spirit in human in, in the human mind or something? I, I don't know. But humanists will say, well, I'm a good person because I have empathy and compassion, and you must be a sociopath. Right? That's the language they use when they talk about good and evil. They um they have this myth that we evolved to be good uh, and to be altruistic because we have empathy and compassion. So yeah, to the humanist, moral goodness equals altruism, and they believe that humans are intrinsically good by nature, and that this also gives us the capacity to recognize moral goodness and badness in others. Uh, I mean, you know, I could go off on a tangent about the humanist uh, worldview and its view of morality, goodness and badness, but... Uh, well, it's not really that important here. 
Again, there, there is some truth to this view. It's not entirely false. It does help to sort of make sense of things. We evolved to be cooperative as well as competitive, but not altruistic. So the half-truth is that we evolved to be cooperative. Like the, the error is thinking that we're altruistic and that cooperation is altruism. The truth is that while we often compete, we can also cooperate. We are social. We evolved to be social. And we do have the capacity for empathy, but of course we also have the capacity for negative empathy, which is hatred. That's the feeling you feel toward your enemies, your competitors. Right? That's what makes somebody an enemy, is that they're competing with you. Their interests conflict with yours, and so you view them with hatred. And this motivates you to harm them, right? to get them out of your way, because they are um, negatively impacting your life. Uh, but even positive empathy has a selfish function. We feel positively empathetic toward our children, because that's how we reproduce. We feel a kind of conditional positive empathy toward our friends and our mates because we're in a cooperative relationship with them. But if that cooperative relationship breaks down, the empathy breaks down. If your friend doesn't return favors, he, you know, doesn't treat you very well, you'll stop caring about him and you may even wish him ill. And the same goes for your spouse. Whereas with your children, they don't have to do anything for you, for you to care about them, right? So all of our emotions have underlying biological functions, and none of them is altruistic, um, you know, unless you want to use the word altruism to label things like parental investment. And I have a, a long essay on that called Altruism and Selfishness which is in the book On the Edge, and there's an older version on my blog, which is probably less um, refined. Anyway, so yeah, humans did not evolve psychological mechanisms to produce the moral values that humanists profess. This is all delusion. The human form did not evolve to be altruistic. It evolved to reproduce, like every other biological form. The conscience is not an innate knowledge of good and evil. It is the internalization of moral or collective values. It is acquired knowledge of collective values. An individual's moral goodness or badness depends on two things. One is how deeply he has internalized the collective values of his culture and society. And then two, it depends on the strength of the social incentives in his environment. The folk theory of morality is confusing when it comes to why people are immoral. Like, why are people evil? It presumes that people have innate knowledge of moral values and that those values are both objectively and subjectively normative. So they naturally feel normative to the individual. And yet, some people have the desire to do evil. So, so why would they have that if they have this innate conscience that makes them view these objective values as also subjectively normative? This adds another wrinkle. If you believe that evil people have the innate ability to recognize that their acts are evil, but do not feel compelled to do good, then there is yet another thing, which is the degree to which somebody is internally aligned with those values, right? So they presume that everybody, even the evil person, can recognize that their actions are evil. Now, there might be some people, some humanists uh, in particular, who don't believe that, who believe that the sociopath can't see good and evil the way they can, right? But it doesn't really make sense. Like, um, the folk theory has all these assumptions that don't really make sense together as a system. Like, that we have the innate ability to recognize good and evil, and these things feel subjectively normative to us, but they also sometimes don't. And some people 
do evil, even though they have the ability to recognize it, but they still want to do evil. Uh, and that there is a distinction between individual values and moral values. Otherwise, there could be no struggle between them. But at the same time, moral values are normative from an individual perspective. So like, on the one hand, they feel the same as like a value judgment, like I want an ice cream cone. But on the other hand, they don't. Um, if moral knowledge is innate, then why would we even make a distinction between moral values and personal or individual values? Why would we have all these notions like the struggle, the conscience, and so on? The truth is that moral values are imposed on us by social power, even if we agree to them, right? Even if you agree to the social contract, it still has to be imposed on you. Even if you agree that you want a clean water supply, there still has to be a mechanism to impose that on everybody. Anyway, so collective values are imposed on us by social power. We internalize that, uh, the knowledge of those values as moral knowledge, and this uh, subconscious moral knowledge gives us the ability to make moral judgments but we still recognize a distinction between moral values and our individual values because they have a different underlying basis, right? So you can make sense of it if you get rid of the objectivity assumption and the folk theory. All right, now I'm going to talk about the top layer, which is myths. And these come in two forms, individual and social or collective. So I'm going to start with individual, and then I'll go on to collective. Individual moral myths. The objectivity assumption and folk theory conflict with the reality of human nature and morality. People use moral myths to deal with these conflicts. Moral myths involve false claims about internal motivations and external behavior. They hide the reality of human nature behind a pretense of moral goodness. They also support the individual's advocacy for his own interests within the collective. The individual pretends to be more internally aligned with collective values than he actually is. He also tries to align collective values with his individual values whenever possible. So it's one of the ironies of morality that it creates a higher level tragedy of the commons, a higher level competition to pretend that you're more virtuous than you are, and also to shift the morality of your collective in the direction that benefits you. So people are engaged in a selfish struggle over defining collective values and they're also engaged in a selfish struggle for moral virtue or status. Almost every individual claims to be morally good. He claims and believes, at some level at least he believes, that he would not steal, rape, or murder, even if he could get away with it. He claims and believes that moral goodness is built into his soul or character. He has a myth about his own motivations, and this myth often extends to his actions as well. He hides bad behavior and displays good behavior, right? So if he does something good, he will try to make it so that everybody knows about it. But if he does something bad, he will try to diminish it or hide it. And he might even be hiding it from himself. This usually involves some level of self-deception. The individual believes in his moral goodness, and he is not fully aware of his hypocrisy. He hides his bad behavior not only from others, but also from himself, with post-hoc rationalizations. 
You know, like somebody will go to a store and steal something and then say, well, it's a big company. They make a lot of money. You know, they're ripping off the consumer. They're ripping off whatever. You know, people will come up with little lies, sometimes very big lies. And they're not just telling them to others. They're, they're telling them to themselves to maintain this internal pretense, this internal delusion. The pretense of moral goodness requires many little lies. Being selfish, the individual naturally advocates for his own interests within the social environment. He tries to maximize his benefits and rights while minimizing his costs and responsibilities. Much of this advocacy involves appealing to moral values. Self-advocacy has two aspects. Number one, arguing that one is morally good or not morally bad, and thus deserving of rewards or not deserving of punishments. For example, an accused criminal might argue that he is innocent and should be released, or that there were mitigating factors involved in his crime and so the punishment should be less. And number two, arguing for collective values that are aligned with one's own interests. For example, a poor man might promote charity as a collective value, while a rich man might promote self-reliance as a collective value. So to some extent, people say, you know, they get behind one collective value or another, depending on whether it would benefit them. Now, today, this is actually less important, and people are less engaged in it, because in a big society, you can have very little effect on the, the morality of the culture or the society as an individual. Um, you know, there are some exceptions, but generally speaking, you don't have much control over it. Whereas in a small group, people might spend a lot of time and energy trying to shift the values of the group in a direction that benefits them. In a large group, people tend to focus on virtue signaling instead of um, shaping the collective values. So again, this is the big irony of morality. Individuals use moral myths to compete with other individuals for the resources of society. The pretense of goodness is a claim to moral status and moral status confers benefits. People compete for moral status by establishing their personal claim to goodness while undermining the claims of others. Advocacy is a selfish competition for resources. It is often organized around competing ideologies and even competing moralities. Political conflicts are often moral conflicts based on competing moral myths. So the pretense of altruism is selfish. Collective values are useful in solving problems of cooperation, but they also create a new arena of competition and new problems of cooperation. Even if we collectively agree to a cooperation scheme, there is still an incentive to defect on the scheme or rig it in your favor, if you can get away with it. Self-advocacy is a tragedy of the commons. So the basic point is that morality then creates this new arena of competition in which selfish individuals compete for the resources of society either by claiming moral superiority or competing for moral status, or by trying to rig the morality in their favor. All right, now I will talk about collective moral myths. Like the individual, society also has a myth of its moral goodness. Every society has a myth of its objective goodness within nature and the cosmos, Every society views its existence as having some great cosmic or historical purpose. This claim is a way of justifying its existence 
and what it must do to exist. Like individuals, societies are selfish. Societies exist within nature, and so they have to extract resources from nature. This involves the large-scale killing of other life forms and the destruction of ecosystems. Societies also compete with other societies. This competition takes place outside the boundaries of society, and so it is not governed by the rules of society. It is governed by the rules of nature. For example, societies generally prohibit murder, killing other members of the society, but fight wars in which they try to kill members of other societies. A society must violate its own internal rules to exist. It must be evil when viewed from an external perspective, while imposing goodness on its members. It requires a moral double standard. A society cannot obey the rules and norms that it imposes on its members. If a society pretends that its collective values are objective, then it must be hypocritical. This double standard is typically justified with myths. Societies have myths that justify a moral distinction between insiders and outsiders. And perhaps the best example of that is uh, in the Bible. You know, the chosen people. God says, thou shalt not murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, and all these other things. And then God, God also says, go over there and kill all those people and take their land and hamstring their horses and put everyone to the sword and burn the cities to the ground, right? <laughs> and so that's a bit weird, right? It's funny because in the you know ancient past, people actually had a more explicit understanding of this moral double standard. Like different cities would have different gods. So like it was okay to kill the worshippers of that filthy god over there, right? So societies typically label competing societies as evil to justify acts of violence against them. And also humanity is placed above the rest of nature in a cosmic hierarchy. And again, the Bible is a great example of that. Right? Man has dominion over the animals. Well, this is used to justify the extraction of resources from nature. It is used to justify treating animals, plants, ecosystems, etc. in ways that we're not supposed to treat other people or other, other members of the society. And then finally, the internal order of society is portrayed as being objectively good, perhaps because it comes from God for example, the Ten Commandments, or because it exists of self-evident truths, like the U.S. Declaration of Independence. But of course, neither of those things is true. And societies also have to violate their, their norms to impose the social contract, right? And, and this is what makes anarcho-capitalists get all mad and, and start jumping up and down and screaming that, oh, society's putting a gun to your head, but you're not allowed to put a gun to somebody else's head. And yeah, there is a hypocrisy, but it's necessary. The only thing that prevents us from holding guns to each other's heads is society holding a gun to our heads. Because nature doesn't do it. And we don't have some internal goodness that does it either. So like that's that's why society has to be hypocritical. At least if it's pretending that the internal order of society is, is based on some kind of cosmic principle of good action rather than a pragmatic set of norms for making a society function. So anyway, all of these myths, the individual ones, the collective ones, are self-deceptions, right? And, and the social myths are collaborative self-deceptions. The members of society believe them because of conformity and obedience. 
and they are used to signal virtue to other members of society in that, you know, selfish uh, status competition. If you question the moral myths of your society, you risk becoming a moral outsider and being cast out of the moral circle, right? So if you don't go along with the moral assumptions and the moral myths and the hypocrisies of your society, then you will be cast out of it and you will become a target of violence, right? Now, now it's acceptable to hurt you because you're a moral outsider. Okay, so to wrap it up, morality is like a layer cake. The first layer consists of collective values. The second layer is the internalization of those values by the individual. The third layer is the objectivity assumption. The fourth layer is the folk theory of morality. And then finally, we have the icing and decorations on top individual and collective moral myths. The first two layers are hidden from the awareness of the ordinary person. He is affected by them, but he does not understand them. He knows collective values only through his subconscious internalization of them. Everything above internalization is deception or delusion. We need collective values for society to function, and individuals will naturally internalize those values. We do not need the layers above internalization. We could replace the objectivity assumption and everything above it with a realistic and pragmatic theory of the individual and society that would eliminate morality as such. And I believe that we should eliminate morality because it is no longer functional and it prevents us from being rational about ourselves. It prevents us from understanding ourselves, understanding society, designing societies that work, and really to go beyond our current condition or even to maintain modern civilization, we really need to go beyond morality. Or as Nietzsche would say, beyond good and evil. And I will end it there. As always, thanks for listening.